Hey there. If you are just tuning in, start back at the beginning. Everything will make a lot more sense if you do. Previously on Shots in the Back. What is it you don't believe that you saw? That people could allow themselves to live in such filth without actually exerting themselves to some extent to do something about it. There was a fear, uh, a great fear, but uh, but nevertheless, the bar card exhaled. There was a girl out there that had seen the incident happen, and she said, that's him, that's the white man that did that, that beat up somebody. It seems that the courts are blind to the fact that police officers Officers also have civil rights. This is Shots in the Back, exhuming the 1970 riot. I'm Cease Tatura. So at the end of episode four, Reverend Claude Harris asked a question that stuck with us. Was it worth it? Was it worth all of these people getting arrested? Was it worth that little boy getting shot? Was it worth him dying? I've wrestled with Harris's question since I first interviewed him in 2012. How do you go about answering that question? So in our final episode, we'll examine this from a few different points of view. And then we'll ask, where does Augusta's quest for racial justice go from here? Recently, I had a group call with some of my students from Jesse Norman School of the Arts, and Atticus Dillard Wright was one of them. Maybe it was worth it, but since these things are happening still today for the same sorts of reasons, but for the most part, yes. But when I asked them how they arrived at their answers, they, they kind of struggled. You know, let's be honest. It's been six months away from the classroom, away from this project. Their thoughts were a little fuzzy, but Essence Willingham gave it a shot. I don't really know how like to answer the question, but I feel like the looting and stuff that didn't need to happen. But I understand like they're what they're trying to get through. Like if they didn't do that, then they couldn't really like get their point across. If they needed something to get the police or government involved in to get their point out, get it through. To Essence's mind, it was worth it. She sees it this way. Black Augustans finally got the sincere attention of white city officials and business leaders. And ultimately, it resulted in a few positives. A summer work program targeted at Black boys. And in the Turpin Hill neighborhood, the city installed water and sewerage by 1972. But some would argue these could have been achieved by peaceful means. Corey Rogers isn't convinced. He's a historian at Augusta's Lucy Craplaney Museum of Black History. Do we really know if the Civil Rights Act and the Voting Rights Act of 64 and 65 would have been passed? if in the back of the mind of white politicians, they didn't also see Malcolm X, they didn't, they didn't just see Martin Luther King. Rogers says that mutiny can be a powerful tool. You know, as Malcolm X once said, you know, to the Kings, I can be the boogeyman. I can be the bad cop to King's good cop, you know. And sometimes you need to strike that balance where you are marching for peace But you also, at the drop of a dime, know that um, you want to put the fear of God into your enemy and know that we want to stand up for what we believe. There is plenty of evidence that the threat of violence prompted action. After the 1968 riots that broke out across the country, several racist laws and legal rulings were overturned. But the progress didn't last. Uh, But then no sooner did we have those uh, pieces of legislation did we have the campaign and the presidency of of Richard Nixon, who who campaigned. uh, He he rode the the white backlash uh, into office because he campaigned in 1968 uh, on the theme of law and order. 
That's University of Georgia historian Robert Pratt. And he says Nixon campaigned on fear. Here's one of Nixon's ads, and it features an older white woman walking by herself at night along a downtown street. Today, a violent crime is committed every 60 seconds. A robbery every two and a half minutes. A mugging every six minutes. A murder every 43 minutes. And it will get worse unless we take the offensive. Freedom from fear is a basic right of every American. We must restore it. Crime had increased around this time in the U.S. It was in proportion to the nation's population growth, namely baby boomers. Nixon's team stoked white fear that Black people in particular would sully white morality and safety. It played into stereotypes of Black men as violent and depraved. Nixon's solution was the war on crime and war on drugs. That, in turn, ushered in the long-lived era of mass incarceration of Black people. Nixon's vice president later admitted it was a strategy. The administration wanted to undermine Black progress and progressive politics. Pratt says Donald Trump is using the same tactics. I'm convinced that much of what we see today in the Donald Trump presidency is a response and a backlash to eight years of Obama's presidency. Backlash has happened in response to all major American social movements. Jim Crow in the wake of Reconstruction, conversion therapy after gains made in LGBTQ rights. To my student Aidan Allen, this suggests Ultimately, the violence of the 1970 rebellion wasn't worth it. Honestly, I I kind of think that it kind of wasn't worth it because in the end, like, the message wasn't really, like, didn't get out there. Like, in the end, it was forgotten. And, like, a bunch of people got hurt and died for the riot just to be forgotten. Does the fact that the uprising was forgotten mean that it wasn't worth it? Would Augusta have opened an office to field discrimination complaints if there hadn't been the riot? Would the teenagers have been kept in the county jail? How do we measure what makes an uprising worth it? And if we figure out how to do that, can we also figure out a way to move forward? Recently, several academic researchers have come out with findings that nonviolent resistance is statistically far more effective than violent resistance. Omar Wasso is one of those researchers. He's an assistant professor of politics at Princeton University. In about 50 percent of the cases where social movements used nonviolent tactics, they were able to achieve their outcomes as compared with about 25 percent of the cases where protesters used violent tactics. Wasso looked specifically at how different types of civil rights era activism influenced voting. And what I found in the 1960s was that protests that were generally nonviolent and or were objects of violence tended to get more sympathetic press coverage that tended to have, you know, headlines that focused on civil rights. Um, In the later period, beginning, you know, in the mid-60s going through the early 70s, protests that included protester-initiated violence tended to generate headlines that were more likely to include words like riot. This doesn't mean that violence is always absent from the protest. It means the activists are nonviolent. So the media captures images of police or counter protest or violence, and in reaction, public opinion swings in the favor of the activists. Wasso says this can shape public opinion, policy, and elections. He uses the 1964 and 1968 presidential elections as examples. The Civil Rights Amendment passed just before the 1964 election. It pitted President Lyndon Johnson against U.S. Senator Barry Goldwater. In 
So we have Johnson, who's clearly a champion of civil rights on the one hand. Goldwater is running on a law and order campaign, so a clear uh, kind of contrast. And in that moment, Johnson wins in a landslide. Law and order does not carry the day. Uh, but what's interesting is that by 1968, we have another contest, Nixon running on law and order, Humphrey, who is the lead author of the Civil Rights Act, uh, running on the Democratic side, and this time Nixon wins. The popular vote between Richard Nixon and Hubert Humphrey was close, and it came following the assassination of Martin Luther King and uprisings across the country. But in my research, looking at survey data, looking at um, county-level election results and, and, and a variety of other factors, I find evidence consistent with the possibility that violent protests tipped the election, that, that uh, violent protests may have cost Humphrey hundreds of thousands of votes, particularly in the Midwest and the Mid-Atlantic. Some of Wasso's colleagues take issue with his conclusions and suggest other factors led to Nixon's election, in particular white backlash, the type Robert Pratt spoke of earlier in this episode. Research shows that backlash often begins before any progress has been made. It appears as caution. Martin Luther King Jr.'s 1963 letter from a Birmingham jail addresses that concern. I have almost reached the regrettable conclusion that the Negro's great stumbling block in his stride toward freedom is not the white citizen's counselor or the Ku Klux Klaner, but the white moderate who is more devoted to order than to justice, who prefers a negative peace, which is the absence of tension, to a positive peace, which is the presence of justice, who constantly says, I agree with you and the goal you seek, but I cannot agree with your methods of direct action, who paternalistically believes he can set the timetable for another man's freedom. In King's view, white inaction was the problem. Their claim that violence was what deterred them from supporting racial equality was an excuse, an excuse not to change the status quo. You assert that our actions, even though peaceful, must be condemned because they precipitate violence. But is this a logical assertion? Isn't this like condemning a robbed man because his possession of money precipitated the evil act of robbery? Society must protect the robbed and punish the robber. My student Atticus sees both sides of this quandary. Yes, the violence in Augusta forced white leaders to finally address some of black residents' concerns. But he also sees that whites opposed to justice then found new ways to stymie black progress. To make long-term change happen, you cannot use violence because, like... What has been happening now is very similar to what was happening in 1970. And we're still, like, calling for the same types of change. And still not very much is happening. In King's opinion, social change wouldn't take that long if white Americans got on board. If they became committed to their nation's ideals of justice instead of comfort, then progress would come. And without it, progress is as slow as a mule-drawn cart, as was the case in Augusta's Hyde Park neighborhood. We talked about that neighborhood in episode two. It was built in a floodplain and surrounded by industry. Former resident Charles Utley and I are visiting it. The smell. Do you smell that smell? Yeah. It smells like cat litter and laundry detergent. Mm -hmm. Is that what it smells well, like well, to you? I, I would say like um, something that's been burned. Well, like it wouldn't be a tie burn, but it would be like a chemical burn. Yeah. That would be off. Is what I'm smelling. Yeah. 
Some of you wondered what happened to it. Did it get sewers and paved streets? Yes, it did. But after that battle was won, another one started. In the 1980s, the county health department told residents that their wells were poisoned. They shouldn't use them for drinking, for bathing, garden watering, pretty much anything. Residents stopped using the wells, but they kept getting sick. Utley says babies were born with birth defects and kids had skin lesions, and cancer was ubiquitous. There were over uh, 300 families out here. You're going to get at least over 100 people easily. And I, I'm, I'm almost sure we're over 100 now. Actually, that tally is much higher. In the 1990s alone, the county health department recorded 180 cancer-related deaths. Brain, bone, and skin cancers were common. Utley and others began trying to understand why, and eventually what they learned was that a telephone pole factory across from their neighborhood had admitted to contaminating the area with creosote and arsenic. The company had compensated white residents in a neighboring subdivision, but they never told Hyde Park residents. So they asked for help, first from local government, then county, and finally the state. They got nowhere. Georgia's Environmental Protection Division declared the neighborhood's soil and water had acceptable levels of arsenic and lead. So did the U.S. Department of Health. And both statements were untrue. But residents would need proof, and that would take money. So they applied for a federal Environmental Protection Agency grant. These grants are usually applied for by local governments. They're complicated and massive applications. But at least as residents had been put off so many times, the neighbors had no choice but to take on the process themselves. And, and so therefore, we, we, we had gone through all of those keys. We had gone to Washington. We had been in, on the Senate hearing. We had carried the, the water, contaminated water, to Congress and presented it to them for evidence. So it was bringing an embarrassment to the city of Augusta. The EPA approved their application. Utley takes me to the first intersection of the neighborhood and stops. He points at a fenced off lot. The telephone pole factory wasn't the only polluter. On this side was Goldberg Brothers Junkyard. Um, uh, approximately 10 stories high was stacked with just junk. And like cars or like what? Cars. They're all recyclable. And uh, we also found in the junkyard building, which was right in this front here, car batteries. Just stacks of them. Researchers found that the soil and water in the neighborhood had extremely high levels of known carcinogens. It was a win, but cleanup wouldn't start until 2001, 17 years later. Funding came primarily from the state and federal coffers. The junkyard took $10 million to clean it. It was just that much junk on it, that it, that it, had, it had that much... Uh, uh, ties and rubbish on it. Residents were relieved. Their efforts had made a difference. Unfortunately, their land and water were still toxic. The insulation factory, the major power substation, the railroads, the new junkyard, all of these contributed to the pollution. Bob Young was mayor at this time. His administration cleaned up the junkyard. But residents still lived on toxic soil. Young says there was no money and no solid plan for the residents. Instead, they put up warning signs. One advised residents not to swim in the drainage ditches. And then we had to deal with what are we going to do next? What comes after that? Are we going to uh, do anything with the neighborhood? Are we going to improve it? Are we going to get the people out of here? And then those were subsequent steps that really came the, the big buyout and all that came after I, I left office. Almost 10 years later, 
Augusta Richmond County finally agrees to buy out residents. All told, getting out of Hyde Park took more than 30 years of contamination reports, lawsuits, and public pressure. That's a long time to wait. In that time, six different men held office as Augusta's mayor. This sort of environmental racism is still common. Take Flint, Michigan. In 2014, residents started complaining about the quality of their water. It was brown. The state denied any problems. Two years later, Michigan was forced to acknowledge the contamination. The water was poisoned with lead. Now, in 2020, the state has agreed to pay Flint residents, and their victim's compensation account currently stands at $600 million. These are the sort of facts that give students like Atticus Dillard Wright pause. It feels like, on a personal level, only people in positions of really high power can do much of anything at all to, like, stop systemic racism from happening in the police and other government um, agencies. Historically, those are the people who haven't made stopping systemic racism a priority or who won't admit that it's a problem. And there is a fundamental rule in politics. Here's former Mayor Bob Young explaining it. People don't give up something without getting something. And and the key is finding out what the other person wants. And politics has taught me it's not necessarily the thing on the table that the person wants. Given that rule, what do disenfranchised Black people have to offer politicians? Hyde Park residents had something to offer Augusta's politicians— the chance to avoid further national embarrassment. All the region had to do was clean up a toxic waste site. What do today's racial equity activists have in their back pockets? When we come back, we'll hear about the kinds of protest tactics Augustans are using today. That's ahead on Shots in the Back. This is Shots in the Back. I'm C. Stachura. Welcome back. In this second half of our final episode, we're talking about the ways Black Augustans and others are continuing to push for racial equity 50 years after Augusta's riot. Sean Edwards is one of those Augustans. He's the executive director of Augusta's Land Bank Authority. It's a nonprofit that works with the region's government to improve housing access and redevelop blighted areas. He also sits on the 1970 Augusta Riot Observation Committee. He and I know each other through that committee. I have to fight for my people. That is not to say that I don't want all people to win. I couldn't be human, and really I wouldn't be black if I was that way, because that's just not our nature. We are not conquerors and emperors looking to establish empires around the world. It's never been what we've done throughout history. We find harmony and balance with nature. Many of Edwards's redevelopment projects are in the neighborhoods where the riot took place. A little over 10 years ago, the region began reinvesting in the area. At that time, it was about 50 percent vacant. So the goal starting out was to bring people back. You can't put a designation on who people is. It's just those who want to live in a community. You don't want to racialize it. But it is going to be racialized because the primary person that's going to come back is going to have a connection to the area, be its history, be its proximity. And that's where that project started. It then blossoms because you're getting an occupancy to where now it feels more safe. Right now, these neighborhoods are a mix of people. Seniors on fixed incomes who live in bungalows, worth roughly $30,000. 
And those sit next to newly constructed two-story homes worth about 150000 Students at Augusta University's Dental College needed housing, so vacant churches and houses were torn down to build high-rise apartments nearby. Edwards says that housing was necessary, but it will lead to an era of gentrification. You want to bring a bunch of people in to repopulate the area. You want to be able to raise incomes in order to provide services. All of that is necessary. But when you bring in 200 units at one time, you're not bringing in 200 black folks. So that goes back to the ripple effects. Does the African-American neighborhood stay an African-American neighborhood? It doesn't. Why is that? Because African-American neighborhoods are allowed to become depressed areas. That can happen for a variety of reasons. But no matter why it happens, Edwards says it cuts into Black intergenerational wealth. Let's say your grandma's wealth is tied up in her home. If her neighborhood goes into decline, her home depreciates. She has less to borrow against, She also has a smaller inheritance for the grandchildren. Edwards says for Black folks, grandma's house is almost always in a depressed neighborhood. Blacks are no further along than we were when we were released from the plantation. Our percentage of ownership, what we own, control, and can pass down to our children, has not moved. To his point, in June of 2020, a study came out about the wealth gap between Black and white families with school-aged children. Here's an anchor with Chicago's WTTW with the headline. New research shows the wealth gap between Black families and white families has widened since the Great Recession. And although the gap between white and Hispanic families has shrunk slightly, it is still massive. The study from Northwestern University shows that for every dollar a white family has, black families only have one cent. That's not news for Edwards. For him, it points out how necessary these reinvestment projects are for black success and how much more there is to do. He questions whether the county really wants to see economic and social advancement. What you put your money into is what's important. Doesn't matter your value system, doesn't matter your ethnicity, gender, race. What you spend your money on is what you believe in. In the past decade, Augusta Richmond County has concentrated its urban renewal efforts on projects that foster primarily white, middle, and upper class opportunities. Projects like the Georgia Cyber Center campus, high rise apartments for medical students, and parking decks for corporate offices. Meanwhile, Edwards says historically Black neighborhoods remain disinvested by comparison. Augusta's current mayor, Hardy Davis, says local government tries to be conscientious of how growth impacts all of its residents. When we talk about risk, you know, uh, we don't always do SWOT analysis of the opportunities that present themselves, uh, but you have to humanize opportunity and an underserved parts of our community in Augusta, we have always got to keep in mind that as we're moving new people in, we can't do it at the expense of those who already exist here. But those legacy residents are being priced out of Augusta's historic neighborhoods. So activists like Jamie Tutson are focusing their energies on empowering Augusta's disenfranchised. Tutson is an oncology nurse, mother, and founder of the organization Black. That stands for Bringing Lives and Communities Closer. How you doing? You old enough? You want to get registered to vote? Come on over here. Come on. Don't walk off. Tutson's organization has a wide aim, from neighborhood improvement to police accountability. Most weeks, she and her volunteers deliver food and supplies to the homeless. And right now, before the election, they're also registering voters. The young man she's talking to, though, he is not interested. That's their reaction. My vote doesn't count. Why am I wasting my time? I don't I don't know who's in the office. They don't care about me anyway. Like and they think it's just the presidency. Like that's what he said. I was like, it's more than just the president up for election. Well, exactly. What about your local elections? The D.A., like the D.A. for young black guys, especially, is a big deal. That's why we're targeting these neighborhoods specifically. You know what I mean? It's these young kids who don't know what's going on. 
don't even know like of where their polling location is or if they're registered. Those are the ones we're trying to get. Tutson says she volunteers as an activist because her parents couldn't. I do kind of feel like our parents were just working so hard to give, you know, to, to survive that they probably couldn't focus on these things. But now it's like, okay, we're surviving, but I'm not living. I'm like working so hard, you know, for what generations before us were handed out, you know, like the cost of college, the cost of houses. And so it came to a point of like, why? Like, I guess it's just more frustration about what's going on now and then wanting the better future for my kids. This evening, she and another organizer send out eight volunteers to register voters. They cross a busy road and head into a sprawling apartment complex. After an hour, they return with eight new registrations. It's not a big haul. So they talk strategy. How else could they best approach people and convince them that registering isn't dangerous or pointless. But overall, activist Morris Porter feels all right about their results. Over time, they've added quite a few voters to their roles. If I had to give you a guesstimate, a round figure, I would say maybe six, seven hundred, awesome. you know, um, just these past few months. That's awesome. But if you, we do it throughout the whole mm, year. That's why I say y'all do it all on a regular basis. Yeah. I'm so glad you come out and do it, because I've learned a lot doing it coming out here with you. <laughs> Porter leads the Augusta chapter of the National Action Network. It's a civil rights organization founded in the mid-90s. He's also helped develop local leadership groups for young men and women of color. And he's leading the protest for the removal of Augusta's largest Confederate monument. All of this is a lot of effort, and others have failed in the past. But Porter feels like change is in the air. Finally, our white counterparts yeah. actually feel or see what, we, what we've been um, enduring all this time. Luckily, on? technology has, has brought that to what light for us. Because, you know, our voice or our, our word just wasn't good enough. Now they actually see it themselves, and it bothers them too. So that makes them kind of, you know, want to um, get involved. This harkens back to Dr. King's call for white engagement, putting justice ahead of order. Tutson sees this too, and she's both frustrated and pleased. Frustrated that it has taken seeing police repeatedly murder black men to get white America to care. Pleased they finally are. And she's stepping up her game, too. She's studying the county sheriff's standard operating manual. We requested their SOP and um, like their code of conduct and everything. So we've been like slowly just going through it all. Because we don't want to say we can't hold them accountable if we don't know like what they need to be held for accountable instance, for. The sheriff's website claims permits for marches and rallies must be submitted 30 days in advance. The sheriff's manual, though, says only three to five days are required. When it comes to public change, knowing these little details can make all the difference. And this is the sort of thing that even teenagers can do. Still, students like Atticus Dillard Wright are cynical. He wants to be hopeful. He sees a need for his generation to step up. But... Begin uh, going, try to run for seats of government like the senate or the president but i don't think that would do anything um and we could use the powers of those people to pass laws that create change essence willingham also struggles to come up with a plan of action i feel like um there should be, like, more black cops incorporated into the police or something like that. According to 2016 Bureau of Justice Statistics, only about a quarter of all law enforcement officers are people of color. But academic research has found those officers still stop black and brown drivers disproportionately. But how would Essence or any other student know these facts? 
They aren't taught in this school, and generally public schools don't teach how civil rights activists or suffragists or even Mahatma Gandhi engaged in nonviolent protest. So it's no wonder ideas aren't readily at hand. And then there's student Aidan Allen. After I've buttonholed Atticus and Essence, I turn to him. I ask him what he might do with this knowledge about the riot or how he might reduce racism. I'm kind of just like, I'm not sure what to do. And I don't really, I kind of like being useless. (laughs) It's very comfortable. I laugh because it is very comfortable. If you can't think of something to do, then you can't be blamed for not doing something. Without this podcast project, Aiden most likely wouldn't be talking about racism. And he does see value in that. The podcast is helping, so, like, could be helping. So it's like, I'm kind of helping with, like, getting stuff like the podcast out. If there's one truth about this podcast, it's that the students' perspectives have been invaluable. So yes, I'd agree that he and the others have helped get this history into the world. The uprising isn't included in the state's history curriculum, but recently a few area teachers have said they intend to include it in future Georgia history classes. Uh, Hello, my name is Christy Bryan. I am a Georgia studies teacher at Lincoln County Middle School. And we are about... 45 minutes away from Augusta. Christy Bryan is one of them. She's been a teacher for 30 years, and she already talks with her students about the Augusta riot. She was born a year before the uprising, and she remembers her mom talking about it when she was in grade school. What I remember her just telling me at that time was that um, a riot occurred, There was uh, burning of buildings in downtown Augusta. She didn't tell me the rest of the story. And I don't even know if she knew the, the whole rest of the story. The kids need to know everything so that they can can make their own, I guess you'd say, minds up about what exactly happened. The kids she's referring to are her students at Lincoln County Middle School. She says her district was fully integrated just a few months after Augusta's uprising. About half of her students are Black and the other white. The number one rule in my classroom is respect. And it's respect of other people's feelings and respect of other people's opinions. And once I have that down, it leads to a lot of just open discussions for the kids. When she brings up the 1970 riot, it's more in passing. It's mentioned as part of the lessons on the civil rights era protests. Brian sticks with the facts. Nothing more, nothing less. And she's careful to do so. She knows how touchy the topic is. And she says that's why many teachers don't want to cover it and other instances of racial violence. I believe a lot of teachers are afraid that they might lose their jobs. As someone was saying to me last night, we walk such a fine line. And it's really uh, difficult to pacify everybody. And even though it's facts, this happened, uh, a lot of people are like, why do you want to bring that up? Why do you want to stir up trouble? But Brian asks, for whom would it be trouble? It's certainly a painful memory, a painful moment in our past. Several of the people we spoke with expressed a degree of shame over their actions and inactions. Many others expressed bewilderment at the hate they witnessed. One of the things my students learned over the course of this project was to overcome fear, the fear of being misunderstood or ridiculed, and the fear of feeling, witnessing someone else's pain. For my student, Tiara, that's what made learning about the uprising worth it. 
I don't like just knowing stuff. I like to at least know at like at least two or three levels below. I just need to get a deeper understanding of it so that I can see where people are coming from because my biggest thing and my mom's biggest thing right now is like empathy. Just knowing where both sides come from, it's like, okay, I see that. I don't necessarily agree with that, but I see that. She hopes other people develop empathy, too. In particular, she's thinking of Americans who typically haven't believed systemic racism or police brutality is a big problem. A year ago, Tierra was only beginning to notice how similar present-day racism is to what was happening back in 1970. She was one of the students I drove down to Charles Oatman's gravesite. They recorded audio, took photos, asked questions, mispronounced names. And then we headed back to more familiar territory, Wendy's. A couple of them had never been. We sat around a table, and I turned on my recorder. I asked them if talking about the riot had gotten easier for them. At first, nobody wanted to respond. It had been a long day. Then Atticus complained about his fries. My fries are super salty. Mm-hmm. Like, I hate having a pile of salt in the bottom of the thing. That's my favorite part. <laughs> That's Thomas Collins and Tierra that you're hearing. At first, all eyes go to Tierra. I talk all the time. She does talk all the time. <laughs> Thomas, you talk. I didn't hear your question, but I was just making sure we were on that same topic. Um, I only feel like it's a lot more approachable now, though. Um, not, not in the sense that, like, you know, I'm just going to start, like, randomly spouting about it, but, you know, if it comes up... I'm not going to be like, oh, yeah, that. Um, I got a, I'm an appointment at the dentist's doctor. <laughs> you know what I mean? My, a uh, dentist doctor? Yes. Doctor dentist. Everybody laughs and starts joking. After a while, I ask if he knows what has changed to make it easier. It's gotten easier to speak about racism in general since we've been talking about the riot. That's what I meant to say. I'm trying to break down why here. Um, it's kind of like change or whatever. When change first happens, you don't really like it that much. But then once it keeps going on, it you kind of get comfortable with it. Like, as long as we've been talking about it, it's kind of like we've had to talk about it. So it's like we all kept, became familiar with what needs to be said and whatnot. And so... Over the course of this podcast, you've heard these students evolve. You've heard them struggle to relate to what was happening, sometimes to believe that what they were learning about was being mirrored in the present. And you've heard the struggles of others, too. Black men and women who took on city, county, and state elected officials. They took on people who denied their complaints were even justified or important or based in reality. People who had the power to fire them, arrest them without cause, let them die in jail cells, or worse. Sean Edwards sees that as the gift of the young. They are less attached to the status quo and more willing to take risks. Kwame Ture said that revolution is for the young. I mean, that's just the reality of it. It is going to be young people in the streets, be it civil rights movement with individuals in the forefront being in their 20s, talking to a generation that despised the fact that they were making trouble, or it is the Generation Z teenagers throwing Molotov cocktails and rocks and bottles at police shields. Revolution is for the young. It is my job as an older generation to help finance that push and to help be a part of the strategic plan that comes after. The men and women who stood up in Augusta didn't have to. They could have stayed quiet, accepted the status quo, but they saw fit to fight for their rights and for change for the future. They risked their livelihoods and their lives 
for a chance at better. These are people like Grady Abrams and Wilbert Allen and Claude Harris. They didn't have to relive those painful memories. But they did so so that you would know the story of what happened in Augusta in 1970. Even the ones whose behavior was reprehensible or whose views were controversial or outdated, none of them had to participate. But they did. And my students, who reluctantly took on this project with me, they challenged themselves, they challenged me. And ultimately, they gave this podcast an unexpected dimension. They made all this possible. And what comes next is up to all of us. That's our series. Thanks for listening. Please support the organizations that funded this project, Jesse Norman School of the Arts and Georgia Public Broadcasting. Shots in the Back is reported and hosted by me, C. Stachura, and assistant producer, Rosemary Scott. Our editor is Kiosha Howard. Additional editing support from Josephine Bennett. Nefertiti Robinson, editorial assistant. Research support comes from Corey Rogers at Lucy Craft Laney Museum of Black History and John Hayes at Augusta University. Archival material from the WSB News Film Collection at the University of Georgia Libraries. Oral histories courtesy of Reese Library Special Collections at Augusta University. Additional audio equipment courtesy of Eric Kinlaw. Our theme was composed by Tony Aaron Music. Additional music provided by DeWolf Music. Mixing by Jesse Nicewanger. Throughout this series, you've heard some incredible voice actors. They include Baker Rousseau, Mackenzie Stallings, Fred Hill, Steve Carton, Don Smith, Kimberly Davis, Kimberly Mobley, Nicole Swanson, Mark Scott, Shaniqua Dickens, and Hab Halbertson. Thank you to all of them. Sean Powers is our podcasting director, and Mary Lynn Ryan is the station's vice president of news. Gary Dennis is the executive director of Jesse Norman School of the Arts. This podcast is funded in part by a South Arts grant. <laughs>